morning, everyone. Um, this um, first session is, um, is looking at the morality of, of debt repayment. Um, it's something that um, David Graeber, in his um, anthropological study of 5,000 years of debt, um, has, has looked at and talked about as um, something where there there's, seems to be quite profound moral confusion around debt repayment. Um, uh, but there's one kind of very dominant and core theme sort of that keeps recurring in many societies and also throughout history, which is this morality that um, debt should always be repaid no matter what. Um, just to quote him, he says, if history shows anything, it's that there's no better way to justify relations founded on violence to make such relations seem moral than to reframing them in the language of debt, above all because it immediately makes it seem that it's the victim who's doing something wrong. So this, we want to kind of examine this concept a bit this morning um, and particularly ask why it is that in so many societies at so many points, repayment of debt is, is placed um, as a higher priority than the provision of people's basic needs like food, shelter, access to healthcare, and also people's basic um, participation in social goods like education. And we want to ask if um, this morality is just and also if it's relevant for us, um, for the challenges that we face as humanity in the 21st century, or if we need to revisit it um, and, and find something else. And to, um, to do this, we've got a fantastic and really esteemed panel. Um, uh, our first speaker needs very little introduction. Um, Rowan Williams served as the 104th Archbishop of, of Canterbury, the principal leader of the Church of England. He's an ardent advocate for social justice, um, and he's now a Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, and also the Chancellor of the University of South Wales. Um, and we're also incredibly lucky to be joined by um, lots of international speakers here today, but particularly now um, two fantastic international um, <coughs> campaigners and activists. Um, Njoki Jehu, who is, um, who is and, and so was and still is um, a really key campaigner in the movement in the global south to challenge unjust and illegitimate um, developing country debt, um, and who's also um, founder and executive director of the Daughters of Mumbi in Kenya, um, which is Nairobi-based, and it's an organization which um, works on grassroots campaigning around uh, food sovereignty and gender rights. And also, um, finally, you've got Andrew Ross, who's Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University, um, and who's also an activist with the really exciting US strike debt movement and the rolling jubilee, debt, sorry, rolling jubilee in the US. And he's also the author of many books which are really relevant to this discussion, um, including the recently published, published Creditocracy and the Case for Debt Refusal. Um, and just in terms of format, there's, um, because we haven't got much time, we're just going to keep it to the panel for this session, but then um, Njoki and Andrew are going to be around in other sessions throughout the day, so hopefully there'll be lots of time for you to kind of ask questions and have more discussion. Um, so, um, Andrew, if I can start with you, if that's okay, um, with the uh, first question. Um, what do you think um, this... Could you kind of expand a bit more about this contemporary morality of debt, what you think it consists of, um, and where it's kind of, um, what central messages are and where its disciplinary power comes from? Okay. I um, want to thank you, first of all, and also to Jonathan for organizing this and to everyone for coming out so early in the morning. Such a lovely day. Um, I, when, when I saw the title for the, uh, the session, it gave me pause because uh, I never thought of myself as a moralist. In fact, I, I, I don't like to think of myself as a moralist. Um, but since I've gotten involved in, uh, in debt resistance work, <coughs> I've come to realize very quickly that uh, morality is the primary battleground upon which creditors and debtors tend to clash. And it's almost unavoidable. Um, why is that? It's because it's a, it's a front line of consent for the financial industry. Uh, the financial industry depends on payback morality in order to pursue its claims. And, uh, and I describe it as a, a front line of consent, as a mechanism of consent, because behind the consent, when the consent fails, there are, of course, uh, mechanisms of coercion. 
and, uh, and, and violence, as you mentioned earlier on in the introduction. And those include, of course, the police, the courts, debtors' prisons, the Paris Club, the London Club, the international bond markets, and so on and so forth, the Troika. Uh, many mechanisms of coercion, but uh, bankers would rather would rather operate <laughs> uh, in the realm of consent in, in enforcing our debt obligations. Now, uh, having said that, bankers did not invent uh, payback morality. It's something that's very deeply ingrained in our in mentality in almost every society, and uh, we have been we've been encouraged to believe that. Um, Civilization will crumble if, uh, if people do not honor their obligations to repay debts. We've been encouraged to believe that the souls of individuals, even Anglicans, uh, will be, um, <laughs> will be tar tarnished and perhaps even imperiled as a result. And uh, there are many people who believe that uh, there's an inherent virtue in paying back debts and it's the very definition of justice. It's the very foundation of moral philosophy. But actually, if you look at the case history a little more closely, things get a little complicated. Uh, for example, speaking of moral philosophy, early on in Plato's Republic, Socrates rebuts the argument that uh, the definition of justice lies in repaying debts, because he, uh, he cites a case in which he considers it would not be virtuous to return a borrowed weapon to its owner if in the interim you, um, uh, you were informed that the owner had gone insane. Um, in some cases, in other words, it's more virtuous to refuse to return. It's more virtuous to refuse to pay back your debts. So how do we think about Socrates' lesson? How do we apply it to the current debt crisis? Uh, one of the ways of doing that is to, is to reverse the instrument of moralism or morality or payback morality that the finance industry imposes on us, turn around uh, these instruments and subject the creditors themselves to very heavy moral scrutiny. And how do they stand up to that very heavy moral scrutiny? Not very well. Um, if you've been, uh, and I know a lot of you have, you've been reading the headlines week after week for the last five years, it's been a long pattern of uh, malfeasance, fraudulence, uh, deceit, extortion on the part of banks. The list is very long and grisly. Uh, subprime lending, uh, pursuit of illegal foreclosures, uh, pseudo forgiveness of phantom debts, bankers' collusion and LIBOR rate fixing, um, the payment protection insurance ripoff, uh, the continued mendacity of the collection agents. I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on and on. This, is, that, this kind of moral conduct, very antisocial conduct, uh, is, is pretty reprehensible. And there's no, uh, there's no sign that uh, the finance industry is going to reform that conduct very soon. The likelihood is that they will continue to perform in that manner. So perhaps it's perfectly justified in comparing uh, bankers to Socrates' uh, deranged creditor. Uh, perhaps it's perfectly justified in saying that uh, repaying our debts, those that we consider illegitimate, and I know there's a distinction between legitimate and illegitimate debts that we can talk about, but perhaps we should compare that to the borrowed weapon, returning that borrowed weapon uh, that Socrates fixates on. Perhaps it would be more virtuous. It would be the right thing to do. It would be the moral thing to do to refuse to pay our debts. If, uh, for example, uh, creditors make loans in the full knowledge that those loans will not be repaid, who is the delinquent agent in that relationship? Because the debtor is usually designated as delinquent if that debtor cannot pay back, but surely the creditor is the morally delinquent agent. If a creditor uh, lays a debt trap for you, as they're doing all the time, by extending fresh credit simply so that we can perform existing debt service. If they knowingly lay that debt trap, who is the delinquent agent in that equation? If a creditor makes loans 
knowing full well that the only actor that will benefit from those loans is the creditor and that the, these loans will generate social and environmental harms. Who is the delinquent agent in that equation? These are the kinds of questions I think you begin to ask and get answers for if you turn around the instruments of morality and train them, the heavy artillery, or soft artillery rather, because the heavy ar artillery of the courts, uh, if you turn them upon the creditor themselves. Just one last thing I'd say is that um, most of the moral debate about, um, uh, about debt repayment has revolved around sovereign debts, and with very good reason, because we're seeing failed democracies all across the world right now. <coughs> Elected officials are being uh, forced to prioritize the rights of creditors to be made whole over and above the responsibility to take care of the social needs of the citizenry. In effect, they're being asked to use government as debt collection agents. And, uh, and the result are, are, are failed democracies. Um, we have, uh, we've seen in the historical record that societies that cannot check the power of the creditor class, that they very quickly see the onset of debt bondage and debt slavery. And the big question it really is, are we, are we headed along the same pathway? Are we at that kind of crossroads? Are we on the road to debt serfdom? And, or is it just rhetoric? Because a lot of the talk that's going on uh, right now and for the last decade and a half has, has, been, um, has been full of these terms and concepts that are, have a very ancient uh, resonance, like the debt jubilee, uh, like debt peonage, like debt bondage, like indenture, extreme forms of usury. And in the U.S., we've seen uh, the revival of debtors' prisons in, uh, in almost as many as 20 states now. These were abolished in the 1840s. Each of these terms and concepts has a very heavy moral resonance that dates back centuries, really, to antiquity. Um, but is it just rhetoric, or are we really facing this, this uh, uh, very, very serious crisis, not just of democracy, but an existential crisis? Because many of these debts we're talking about, and, and, and here, a lot of my own work has been on household debts and personal debts for the most part. I think of these as existential debts uh, because uh, they, they're incurred because, um, because the creditor class has, um, has made it absolutely uh, impossible to survive without access to vital social goods that are personally debt financed. And things like education and health care are existential debts because you can't really separate your body from them. Your health and your learning and your knowledge are inalienable assets. Like they're not like houses or automobiles or flat screen TVs where you can separate the asset out and you can sell it on some secondary asset market. Education and health are inalienable. So this is, a, this is an existential crisis as well as being a crisis of, uh, of democracy at the level of sovereign debts. I just end there.